Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Can you picture him? I can. Um, they're, they're standing off to the side and they're watching and all of a sudden there's some commotion and somebody starts breaking through the roof there and all of a sudden this guy is let down uh, from the roof and um, Jesus looks at him and he said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And those scribes, oh, picture him. Now, now they're not saying anything, but they're thinking, did he just say what I thought he said? Why? That's blasphemy. There's only one person that can forgive sins, and that's God. How dare he? Now, let me back up and say this. They were right. There is only one person that can forgive sins. Let's put the cart before the horse for just a moment. The problem was they were bent in their thinking. They were set in their ways. This is not the Messiah that they expected. This is not at all what they envisioned. He was not ruling and reigning like they anticipated. And so in their hearts, they thought there is no way in the world that he could be the Messiah. But I submit to you, he proved it when he said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there was no outward sign that his sins were actually forgiven, but they were. Notice the next verse, and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, why reason ye these things in your hearts? Would that have taken you by surprise? If, if I said, hey, pastor, why are you thinking that right now? And, and just quoted verbatim what he was thinking. <laughs> you know, um, I can't, and I'm not even gonna attempt to try that, but the Lord knew exactly what they were thinking and calls them out on it. I mean, for me, that would have been good enough evidence. Oh, this is the Messiah. This is the one we have looked for. But they were bent in their thinking. Verse number nine says, now the Lord's going to corner these guys, okay? He says, whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk? Would you consider the question? What's easier? Don't overthink this. What would be easier? Notice who he's talking to. Who is the Lord talking to? To the scribes. And he's saying, okay, guys, let me ask you a question. What would be easier? Would it be easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or would it be easier to say, arise, take up thy bed and walk? Well, you consider the question for yourself. If there was somebody up here this morning who had two great needs, number one, they needed to be healed physically. Number two, they needed their sins forgiven. Could you do either one of those things for them? No. You couldn't. But who could do either one? God, Jesus. In other words, th th this is something that only God can do. Only God could heal somebody physically. Only God can forgive somebody's sins. Now, the Lord asked that question for a reason, and the rest of the passage tells us why. We'll read verse 9 again. Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. Now, verse 10 ties this together. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. That was their great dilemma. That was the hang up. That was the speed bump they could not get over. He cannot be the one who forgives sins, he cannot be the Messiah. So, so that they would know that he was, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went before them all. Now here's my question. Did everybody see that? Did they? Sure they did. And the Lord just proved himself twice now to be the God, a very God that he claimed to be. The first time he did it, there was no outward visible sign to the crowd. But it doesn't change the fact that his sins were forgiven. The second time he did it, when he said, Arise, take up thy bed and walk, he did something for this man that only God can do. The man arose, he took up his bed, and he went before them all. Everybody in that crowd saw it. But do you know from this passage and parallel passages, the scribes or the Pharisees or the religious leaders would leave no different than when they came. Why? Because they were set in their ways. It's the exact reason. No, 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 no. I don't care what we see. I don't care what happens before us. This is not what Messiah was supposed to be like. They were wrong, but they were too set in their ways. You ever been guilty of something like that? 
Now, this is an extreme example. I grant you that. And undoubtedly, the blessings of God passed these fellows by on this day because they were not willing to believe. Um, look, we'll have services each night this week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And maybe you say, Brother Coyle, um, I've been in revival services before, and you can count on me. I will be here on Sunday, and I will be here on Wednesday. I'm always here on Sunday. I'm always here on Wednesday. Like a fixture, I will be in my place. Now, I don't normally come the other nights. I won't be here Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. I don't normally do that, but I'll be here the, 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 the Sunday services and the Wednesday service. I'll be here. Okay, here's my question. Why don't you change? You say, no, Brother Cole, you don't understand. See, I only come on Sunday, and I only come on Wednesday. No, 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 I do understand. That's my point. Why don't you change? It's hard to step out of your comfort zone, isn't it? It's hard to do things differently than you're accustomed to doing them. We can get so set in our ways. You know, statistics show that the services you attend are the ones that help you the most. I think they're pretty accurate statistics, okay? So look, being here is going to be a tremendous part of God working in your life. I think this probably happens almost all the time. And you know, I have nothing to do with it. Inevitably, the service you miss will be the one you needed the most. It just happens that way. I, I, I mean, it's just, uh, it's almost a guarantee. You decide not to come, boy, God would have worked in your heart that night. But we're set in our ways. We, you know, I, I bowl on Monday nights. Well, don't do it this week. And, um, you know, I can't be here Tuesday because my favorite TV show is on and I've never missed an episode. Um, look, revival never happens by accident. It doesn't. All of us have an important part. You do and I do. We're going to encourage you to invite visitors this week. A neighbor, someone you work with. Uh, a family member, whatever it might be, you say, oh, Brother Quill, I don't do good at inviting visitors. I can't handle rejection. You know, if people say no to me, well, what if they say yes? Yeah, but what if they say no? Yeah, but what if they say yes? I mean, we're just, we're so set in our ways. We're so bent in our thinking. And we, ne we need to be willing to say, Lord, whatever I need to do this week so you can work in my life, God, I'm willing to do it. W whatever it is. We're in a church in Pennsylvania. Um... Du Bois, Pennsylvania, just a little wide spot in the road there. And um, I said during the Sunday school, I said, look, if you've got to come in your work clothes, that's fine. You know, wh whatever, come. And a fellow came up to me afterwards and he said, are you serious? I said, yeah. And he did. He came every night in his work clothes and he had to leave about 10 minutes before the service was over to get to work on time. That's fine. Come and get what it is that you can get this week. It's important. It really is, because revival never happens by accident. It takes us back to 2 Timothy 4, verse number 2. And um, I want to define two terms and tie them together and then just get real practical, okay? Number one is this. What is preaching? You ever thought about that? What is preaching? Preaching. Any ideas? Nobody here but us. Do you have an idea? Telling others about Jesus. That would come from the idea of proclaiming. Sure. What is preaching? Teaching. I like that. Expounding God's word. Expounding God's word. Exhorting. Yes. Reprove, 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 reprove rebuke, exhort. Any other ideas? Just want to... Get the wheels turning. Should see smoke coming out of your ears. Telling people how to apply the word of God to their life. Exhorting, reprove, rebuke, exhort. What is preaching? You ever thought much about it? <laughs> it's a good thing to think about. I mean, it's the center of what you come to church for, you know, around the preaching of the word of God. So what is preaching? I think 2 Timothy 4, 2 um, defines for us what preaching is. I learned this early in my ministry, and it's been a great help to me. Notice what Paul says to Timothy. Timothy's a young preacher, and he says to Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and